Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is 1 p.m., and I'd like to call to order Brevard County Commissioner's Budget Workshop, February 21st, 2019. Uh, item number one, budget presentation. Mr. Abate. Thank you. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to spend uh, the afternoon with you discussing uh, a variety of items uh, relating to us uh, preparing a budget for the next fiscal year. And so we're looking for uh, to get your input about what we're doing, where the board's priorities are to see where we're going to go in the future. And then we will use all that information to help us as, as we uh, steer a path to that future. And um, there'll be a, variety, a number of people that'll be speaking today. Uh, we're very fortunate we're going to have all the charter officers are also going to present uh, starting at 2 o'clock. But we're going to go through a variety of areas that are, we know are of particular interest and importance to the board. And so that we'll get some either affirmation or some uh, insight that will give us the opportunity to change directions as appropriate. So as we start that, the beginning is going to really focus on, as a foundation for discussion, is the uh, fiscal year 2018-19 budget that we're in. And uh, we're going to look at a variety of, uh, uh, of items, and uh, we hope to get, and my goal would be to get through the uh, first couple of areas, which is general government, general, the overall budget review. Uh, we'll do public works and hopefully utilities, and we'll get through that, and then uh, we'll go to the charter officers, and then we'll finish off with the other areas that are, that are on the agenda. So with that, uh, let me give you some highlights from the 2018-2019 budget. This particular slide that you're looking at you know, highlights a number of our organizational top priorities and initiatives that we have. Uh, for purposes this afternoon, we're really going to focus on, uh, for purposes of a budget workshop, four areas. Uh, those four areas include uh, maintenance, drainage, and reconstruction of the county's road system, addressing other critical countywide infrastructure maintenance and repair needs, um, and, and uh, accelerated the Indian River Lagoon restoration. And then I'm going to highlight and speak a little bit about uh, employee compensation as it relates to recruitment and retention where we are. You know, we, we had a salary study that we're just about ready to bring back to the board. And I'll give you a little bit of an update on where we are with that as well. So having said that, um, what were and what are the most significant budget priorities that we're dealing with in 2018-2019? Uh, road infrastructure, you know, we committed to doing 55 miles of road a year. Um, we actually accomplished, uh, we're in the, uh, finishing off the second year of that. We did 63 instead of 55 in uh, fiscal year 17-18. This year, uh, we're going to target 61, and we might do better than that, but we are targeting 61, even though our commitment and what we told the board when we started the plan was 55. And you'll see some reasons why having more than 55 going forward is important and how we're going to have to identify funds uh, uh, that aren't currently there to help us accomplish that goal and actually go beyond that, which is what uh, I think you're going to, well, I know you're going to hear that from me today. That's where I think where the board wants us to be, and uh, we have a plan that we hope will, will get us there. Um, other things that are of a critical importance that we're dealing with, and we'll address it today, is facilities management and uh, replacing deteriorating building components and other areas where we've had deferred maintenance for significantly too long a period of time, and we're making progress there. But we're going to let you know what progress we're making and where we're going. We'll talk about uh, other areas, including infrastructure and capital, maintaining services. You know, this year. Uh, you know, we did some uh, technology upgrades that we're still working on related to ADA, et cetera, and uh, we're doing some other upgrades and enhancements, security enhancements. Um, we are also, we were able to provide a cost of living adjustment uh, for employees, and our hope is to be able to do something in that area next year. It's way too early to know where, where we're going to go with that, but that is one of the, from an organization perspective in the county manager's office, as we come to the board, that's going to be a continuing high priority for us to do, and that's why we're going to talk about the pay and compensation as well as uh, employee uh, salaries. And then, uh, you know, we uh, put some money in for sheltering. I just had another opportunity to have a good meeting yesterday with uh, 
with the uh, superintendent and uh, we're working on an interlocal agreement uh, moving forward because we have certain obligations under statute now that relate to their participation with us when we deal with the uh, sheltering issues in light of emergencies and I think we're going to be at a good place with that and I have a high degree of confidence that, that we will. So at, at this time, having given you that uh, very brief overview, I'm going to turn it over for Jill to give you some information on general government and uh, after that then uh, it will come back to me and we'll be discussing some areas uh, in public works. Good afternoon, commissioners. The fiscal year 2018-2019 budget was adopted at just over $1.3 billion. And Florida statute establishes the guidelines for counties' annual budgets. And one of the most fundamental requirements is that the, balance, the budget must be balanced so that all of the receipts, including taxation, uh, fees, charges for services, be recognized in the budget, as well as funds being carried forward. And that those receipts match the total appropriation. So what, what you see in this slide is a breakdown of that $1.3 billion budget. The operating revenues <clears throat> re represent the recurring portion of the county's revenue. So these include property taxes, permits, fees, special assessments, things of that nature. The balance forward represents funds being carried forward from the prior fiscal years and there's a variety of reasons that a government could carry <coughs> dollars forward. If you have multi-year projects, also dollars that are set aside in reserves are carried forward. So the balance forward represents about 36% of the total adopted budget. We also have budgeted as revenue um, transfers and these are dollars that go from one fund to another so these aren't new dollars coming in it's a, a good example of that is operating revenue that's received in the general fund it gets transferred to other funds and then spent in in those departments so that's an example of transfers and then for financing the primary source of financing for this year's adopted budget was a state revolving loan for utility services so um, of the $1.3 billion budget, approximately $755 million of that is the operating revenue or the, the reoccurring dollars, the new money coming in. So in governmental accounting, because funds are restricted for specific purposes, uh, they have to be broken down into individual funds and fund types. So what you see in this chart is the fund types that we use to account for the different revenue sources. And oftentimes, as we discuss the budget, you'll hear us refer to the color of money. And this is a concept that was developed to kind of help provide a better understanding of how funds are received and allocated. And so over the next several slides, we're going to discuss the various revenue sources and their limitations. So the general funds represent funds that can be used for any governmental purpose and this is where you really have the most discretion. And what we've done here is we've broken down this slide and the general funds into two separate shades of green. Um, the dark green is the general government revenue and we're going to discuss this a little bit later on. The lighter shade of green represents user fees and services, which are theoretically considered general funds, but they're used to support those specific programs. So, for example, the Sheriff's Office has contracts with the school board, the port, Cape Canaveral, and the funds that they receive from those contracts are used to support that program. So if, if those funds were to be taken away, then you would no longer have the funds to support those programs. So while they're general funds, they are categorized uh, separately there. Uh, about 44% of Brevard's, Brevard County's operating revenues are categorized as special revenue funds, and that accounts for about $329 million of those dollars. So you can see that is the pink shade we have here on this chart. Um, natural resources is about $77.6 million of that. That's made of, of the Save Our Indian River Lagoon half-cent sales tax. Uh, also, there are federal and state grants 
that are part of that number. When you look at public works, those are your local option gas taxes, constitutional gas taxes. They also receive grants. Um, we have the fire assessment, fire MSTU, tourism development taxes. So again, the special revenue funds are those funds that are legally restricted to a specific purpose. The enterprise funds are those business-like activities such as utility services, solid waste, where they generate revenue through uh, user fees and charges for services. So that's represented there in the blue. Um, internal service funds, those are the agencies that support other county agencies. So the biggest example there is the employee benefits. So those are the health insurance premiums that are collected in risk management and human resources to, for the health insurance program. Um, on the capital project funds, I know that looks like a small dollar amount. One of the things I wanted to point out here is that most of the capital projects are completed using special revenue funds or enterprise funds. So, um, so again, that's and there are also general funds are used for capital projects as well. The debt service funds in yellow represent dollars that are restricted to principal and interest payments. So those are our parks and recreation voter approved uh, debt service millages. I mentioned earlier on that about the requirement of having a balanced budget and that's true not only as a total but in the individual funds and programs so what this chart represents is the general revenue balancing of the budget so on the left side you see the revenue sources and this corresponds with the darker green slide that I showed a few slides back so for the general fund you have your property taxes, and then there are some other major revenue sources, such as communication service tax, state shared revenue, and then when you add in the general fund balance forward and some other uh, non-operating revenues, the total general fund is just over $240 million. And so on the right side of this chart, we show how those dollars are appropriated. And we'll get into further detail on the next several slides. Um, so mandates, about $24.3 million are uh, mandates, and this represents programs that counties are required to fund per statute. So Medicaid, uh, for example, this is our required contribution of the state's portion of matching funds for the Medicaid program. Um, and this is calculated by the Social Services Estimating Conference. Uh, the next two items, the school board, the county is required to fund the payments to the property appraiser and tax collector for the services they provide for the school board and the cities. So this is a requirement of Florida statute. So this represents the portion of our budget that goes to that. Uh, the next slide will show the county's portion of that service. Um, we're also required to fund court operations. The $2.3 million shown here is primarily to maintain and operate the three county courthouses. And of course, we also have Baker Act, pre-trial pre detention of juveniles, and other mandates we're required to fund. Jill? Yes. Question. On page 11, or page 10, you have... Charter Officers 108-488. So on the next page, you have Charter Officers 108-488. But above that, you have General Revenue at 24-310. On page 10, you have General Revenue at 21 21-21. Are you, are the mandates? Yes, mandates. So on, on the slide related to mandates, we included the court operations. So if you look at the, the mandates on the general fund sources and uses, if you add the mandates okay. of 21.5 and the court it. operations, that's what uh, that total is there. On the charter officers, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the, this slide because, as Frank mentioned, uh, the charter officers will be coming in this afternoon to discuss their budgets with us. But uh, $108.5 million of that $240 million in the general fund does go to support the charter officers. 
Um, we set dollars aside and reserves to provide options for unexpected issues and risks. Uh, the $22.2 million in reserves for the general fund is actually made up of two components. We have the operating reserves at about $21 million. That's about 10, just over 10 percent of our anticipated operating revenues. And as Frank mentioned earlier, we did set aside an additional $1.2 million in a restricted reserve to cover uh, expenses that we may have with, associated with school board sheltering costs. Um, and then, of course, we also have payments to the CRAs, uh, TIF payments to North Brevard Economic Development Zone, and there is some, some general government debt that we're required to fund. Um, the next slide shows the $35.6 million allocated to public safety and infrastructure, and uh, these have really been identified as core services, so we wanted to break these out separately. Uh, we have public works, which is the road and bridge, and we have facilities, infrastructure. Also in this category, em emergency medical services. Uh, public safety services is comprised of community corrections, the medical examiner's office, and school crossing guards, and then we have emergency management as well. And so, when you, after all of those payments, that leaves about $36.7 million in other discretionary general revenue allocations. And so you can see the breakdown of that here. Uh, $13.9 million goes to support parks and recreation, about 6.8 for general government, which that includes our uh, grants for economic development, um, operating expenses such as unemployment compensation, accounting, auditing, um, and then we have, of course, you can see, I'm not going to read the list to you, but this is how the general fund supports these agencies. All right, so I'm going to take it from here for a while. And, you know, to give the overview as we start diving into the departments and before I get into public works, I did want to spend a few minutes on, on the impact of the CPI change, where we are, where we've been, where we're going with that. And, and as you know, we're limited under the charter to 3% or uh, CPI in general uh, revenue and increases, uh, not to exceed that. And so th we do have the number for the, for the new year that's coming up, and that is going to be a higher number than we've had in past years. It's going to be at 2.44 percent. So that's the number that we're going to be looking at, and I'll give you some information on that in a minute. That index, the CPI index, uh, and, and we've said this before, and I just want, I think it's important to note it again, you're going to see a variety of slides that show you how that impact that that CPI index impacts us in a variety of ways. Um, and most of them, I would say all of them, are not um, positive from the uh, service level and how do you provide that service level with your existing resources when you limit it to that. And so we just want to share that information. We, we've given you a municipal cost index, which is 2.63 percent, and a construction cost index for 2018 is 3 percent. So you can see it's a little bit higher, but, uh, and I'm going to give you some information just of the realities of what we deal with in different areas. But first let me start by, by telling you, well, what does, if we go to the charter cap, uh, and uh, in the general fund, and we multiply, you know, what we get in ad valorem tax revenue, what will that generate in additional revenue to do everything that we want to do, wh what the board wants us to do uh, in next year? And that comes out to 3.6 million approximately in additional ad valorem revenue to cover all the bases of what we're going to talk about today in any direction the board wants to give in, in different areas. So that's the number. Now, you know, a new construction is not included in that, so this is just related to uh, uh, the CPI and what the charter provides for that you could go to uh, that potential without uh, going above the cap. Um, on, on general revenues for the ad valorem. Uh, let me, I'm going to give you now some examples of increases just over one year in terms of additional costs that go beyond the CPI. Now, some of these are general fund. The, you know, for example, a, a rescue ambulance is our general fund, and you see that that went up, 
you know, uh, by a modest amount, but it's 3.97 percent, but it's higher than what the CPI would be. But we, we gave you some other examples as well. Fire engines went up by a little over uh, 5 percent, but in two areas where you heard this from URI in solid waste, and it, while it doesn't relate to ad valorem taxes, it does relate to the board has said and, 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 and its wisdom gave uh, the department the ability to uh, to have a rate structure that uh, has built-in CPI increases, but yet their costs in certain areas go significantly higher than that. And we use the two examples that Yuri gave, which was our additional cost because of market conditions and other things has changed in terms of solid waste tires and its disposal 59 percent higher now than it was a year earlier. Solid waste mulch, uh, and you, if you recall, you already talked about that as well, that's gone up 128%. And, and we're just using those as examples to show that in certain areas we, we face significantly increased pressure than, uh, than what the CPI provides for. Uh, we're not complaining about that, we just think it's important to the board members to, to understand that as we try to, uh, you know, to listen to everything that you have to say and where you want us to prioritize things, realize that in certain areas areas and we're dealing with significantly higher than what the CPI provides for that level of or that current service in certain areas. Um, so let me get into public works which is going to be I think well, uh, has been one of the board's uh, um, focal points in the last couple of years. Um, you know our revenue um, has uh, you can see there that a lot of it is in balance forward and it's money that we have there. But I think what I want to focus on is the last column for you. So we're just giving you this as a revenue slide. We'll be talking a lot more in detail. Um, and that is on the general fund transfer. I, I, let me tell you that over the last three years, that $21.9 million, that has increased over 50, over 50 percent in the last three years. Once again, uh, when, you're, when you're limiting your increases to CPI and what they were, that means we're identifying funds other, from other areas to make sure we prioritize and continue to, to build a foundation that does more and more in the area of roads, whether it's um, repaving, reconstruction, and, and I'm going to get into more specifics of that. But I wanted to point that out to you that uh, in fiscal year 2016-17, the general fund transfer was 13.86 million, and it's uh, 21.9 million now. So you know we we try to be very attentive to what the board you know is asking us to do, and that includes. Once again, that includes facilities now, which is part of public works, which was not the case a number of years ago, but these numbers were adjusted to account for that. <clears throat> In terms of expenses, the, uh, uh, on the next slide you'll see, uh, you know, the capital improvement plan, uh, you know, that's, that's where the biggest chunk of the money is. There's $30 million of grant money in that $74 million that you see there. St. John's Heritage Parkway has $23 million in it. Pineda Overpass has another $19 million. Cone Road has a four million so and then our the money that we're putting in which I think is like nine to eleven million dollars on road repaving and some reconstruction that's all there in that seventy million uh, seventy four million you can see that compensation and benefits for all of you know road and bridge and all other aspects of of uh, public works are at eighteen million and I'm going to get we're going to delve into the specifics of that in one minute but before that let me let's talk about the specific increases in terms of hey what's CPI done in this area while we're contributing significantly more dollars uh, those costs have been escalating at significantly above this CPI and so that puts additional pressure on us to figure out how do we how do we maintain the status quo and how do we get any better than where we are in terms of what we can do and in, in terms of improving road related uh, in, and, and facility infrastructure. And you can see that asphalt has gone up um, uh, around 15%. Um, that 15% increase annualized is an extra $614,000. So instead of 2.44%, you know, if it's the same as it was last year, and I think last year we were at what 2.13, I think, was that a CPI number? So you know, we, we've had to absorb that, 
in terms of the num amount of asphalt. And then the second type of asphalt had even uh, um, uh, a higher cost, a 21 percent increase, and that was another over half a million dollars. Milling costs increased in the last year um, by 33 uh, percent, the culvert cost by 16 percent, and what you see there is in, in the red column at the end of each of those lines is the additional cost that that percent increase cost us. So that's, you know, above the 2.13 percent, then those dollars had to come from somewhere, and they did, so that we could, you know, deliver what, we're gonna, what I'm going to show you on the next slide, the next couple of slides, those services. So we did that for roofing, HAVAC costs over a number of years, and building construction over a number of years. As you remember, if you go back prior to that, um, 2.44 as being the highest number we've had in a number of years. It was 2.13, one or two years before that, it was 0 .0. Two uh, percent in terms of what the increase was in terms of CPI, but we're dealing with these numbers every year um, uh, over time. So, what I think, at least when it comes to the resurfacing plan, and by resurfacing plan, I'm talking about that five-year plan that uh, we brought before the board and committed to to uh, focusing on to achieve. Um, this slide. Uh, talks about that five-year history from a variety of perspectives that I, I, I think the board is going to find of particular interest because it gives a little bit of picture of what we need to do and where we need to identify funds just to stay the course. And actually, I would submit to you for us to do a little bit better than staying the course, and that's what we need to do, maybe even significantly better than staying the course so that we don't lose ground and we actually gain ground. And what you'll see is that while we committed to 55 miles a year, you'll see the 64 miles in 2018 and what that cost was, and that was all in current or proposed funding or that, that was actually utilized in 2018, 2019. Uh, for fiscal year 2019-20 coming up, what you see there is that if we went back to 55 miles, you know, we can cover that for 2020. However, we're going to submit to you that we, you know, we need to do better than that in order to assure that we don't have any roads going back into um, reconstruction where it's going to be at four times the cost. To do that, we have to identify $1.2 million that isn't currently there. So remember I told you we got 3.6 million or whatever that number was earlier of potential dollars well and, and new construction dollars well we need 1.2 to put in there as reoccurring revenue over time because I'm going to submit to you and, and I think uh, uh, public works staff and, and John we've looked at it uh, rather carefully um, we need to increase and augment beyond what we thought we would need and that's assuming a CPI of 2.5 percent. And say, wait a minute, you said, but in certain areas it's higher than that. Yes, it is. But at least we're looking at giving you a forecast that shows what that CPI increase is going to be, and we're committed to finding that extra 1.2 million so we don't lose ground and we actually go to 63 miles a year, which we believe is that magic number that we really uh, will feel a higher, the highest degree of comfort with that we won't put roads into reconstruction where it costs us three or four times. In the long term, that's, that's, I think, a very good place for us to go. So having said that for 2020, we also need to look at 2021 and 2022. What you see in 2021 in the red is the board approved insurance loan. You, you may remember, uh, and Commissioner Lover, when you, you weren't here yet at that time, the board gave us permission to, to utilize additional funds while the constitutional gas tax bonds were being paid off that said, hey, you know what, to accomplish all that we want to see accomplished and continue making progress in roads, if you need to borrow, borrow from the health insurance fund. We came to the board and asked you for $750,000 a year for three years. That's $2.25 million. We are going to utilize that money. We intend to utilize that money. We didn't do it in the first couple of years because we were able to, you know, use resources that were there um, and move them in such a way that we were able to accomplish what we have in, 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 the, in 18 and 2019, and we will do it again in 2020. But to, in 2021, 2022, we'll, we'll use those dollars and repay them in the future years. And that's that what you see in the red. Beyond that, the 1.2 million and 1.3 million that you see in green, you know, thankfully, 
that's not, that's money we will need. That's the same reoccurring dollars that when we identify those reoccurring dollars in 2020, they will be there for 2020, 2021. What will be new dollars are the dollars you see is 486,000 in 2021 and the 953,000 in 2022. Now this is only dealing with resurfacing. And so that's what this slide talks about. I'm gonna, I, I would submit to you that if the board uh, wants to see us do that, that's how currently, unless we get different direction, we are gonna work hard to develop a budget that enables us to accomplish that and identify those resources as, as part of the foundation of the budget that we would submit, of course, depending on a lot of factors that we don't know yet, which is additional board direction and you know what happens when you know we find out what uh, what happens with new construction, what happens with the property values, and, and all that as we, we get ready to develop the budget and other areas like uh, communications, ta uh, uh, FPNL franchise fees, uh, uh, half cent sales tax, and, and other areas. We, we need to combine that with what you see on this slide. Once again, we're using CPI of 2.5%. Um, so we may actually, you know, if it continues at the rate that I showed you previously, say, hey, you're gonna have additional shortfall just to keep going with that. And that, that may be a reality, but we had to use something that was fairly realistic. And since we're limited to the CPI, we use that number at least to build what, you know, what we're showing you today. And you'll see the additional numbers for reconstruction plan. Now you know that there are significant miles that are currently under reconstruction. They're gonna cost us that three or four times. And we're trying to make some headway. The first headway we're trying to make is on the road repaving. The second would be on the additional dedicated funding that we would put into reconstruction. To continue to put 5.9 miles a year, which would take way too long, I think, for what any board member would like, uh, ultimately like is ideal in terms of how much we're able to do. But to do that much, we have to identify additional funding. And that's where you see in 2020, 63,000. That's because of the CPI increase in costs. 128 for 2021 and then 194,000 for 2022. Our, our intention is to build a budget that incorporates that and keeps us at, at least at that 5.9 additional miles every year to do that. So we're gonna have to add those additional dollars in the light orange to the other numbers that I talked about on the prior slide. And you know, you can add that up and you see that that's how much of the resources of new dollars that we're gonna have to identify and dedicate to that to try to keep it at a board, unless the board wants to see us doing something different at a level that uh, we continue to build on what I would suggest is the successes that we are. Some of that is going to be, and I need, and I, I wanted to say that, you know, as we accomplish that, you know, we're looking for to getting some help from actually from the sheriff in some of this and uh, um, and and he's able to do that and we'll be able to do that uh, we, we're having some dialogues with him and how we can identify some of his resources that uh, you know uh, and uh, while that's not uh, totally you know finalized and how that would go you know he's committed to us that he wants to work with us to help the board in those areas because he's heard the board on multiple occasions say that so you know he'll be here himself and I, I think you'll hear it from him as well but we are trying to work as good partners with them in that area so if we're able to accomplish that, what I think, I would hope you would be uh, happy to see is that if we don't do that additional funding that I've just mentioned, our road, uh, the backlog would increase. That's the red line that you see there on the chart. If, uh, if we're funded at 55 miles, you know, then, you know, we, we will be more on a plane because 55 miles a year over 20 years, that would be the normal cycle of road repaving. But because we are behind the curve, we want to increase it to 63 so some of the more deteriorated roads don't fall into that, um, uh, into the reconstruction. So if we do those additional dollars that were the light orange and the 1.2 million that I have to identify, we need to identify this coming year, we are actually, we will make progress and you will start seeing that the backlog of road mileage will be going down over the next three years. And, and, and we are um, very focused on trying to uh, achieve what we think the board wants us to do you know, by accomplishing that. And let me say one other thing, that these are not 
hard and fast numbers because CPI, you know, it's a moving target and it's not necessarily the same CPI as I mentioned that we're using for uh, charter purposes in these different areas. And, and while that's the case, um, you know, we think we're going to make the pro we will be able to move forward um, in a way that uh, will enable us to accomplish things that um, the board will be happy with. And so we are going to do another couple of items and this, uh, let me talk about the drainage, um, coupled with road improvements, one thing that we um, want to do, you, you, you'll recall that this past year we added a drainage crew. And this particular slide shows you that um, how much we are able to accomplish, which was we, you know, admittedly way too little compared to what drainage problems uh, exist throughout the county, but within identified and available resources, we only had one drainage crew countywide. And so they were able to do an average of about 400 uh, feet per day of uh, cleaning ditches, uh, reconstructing, doing what they needed to do. Uh, we had a lot more needs than that provided for. So last year, uh, as part of the budget that we put together, we spent an extra $867,000 of reoccurring money, and that was split into two different ways, as you'll see there. Um, part of it was for um, capital outlay, 740000 of reoccurring money, and uh, personnel costs of about 127000 The reason that was lower is because they used some vacant positions to create the additional people to do the five-person crew. Well, we're, gonna, uh, we're looking at, because we know that flooding is a, a significant concern not only to the board but to, uh, to the community, um, and making sure we do as much as we can in that area, we're going to look to try to put, if we can, um, another drainage crew, which what you'll see is that 400 went to 841. It was a bigger increase, and the reason you see why are they able to do more and why you're able to do more than double with just one more crew is because there's a lot of setup time and travel time that's involved. When you have two crews, uh, you know, you have improved efficiencies. That increases even more if we're able to go to three crews. The good news is that while that shows as a, a million dollars plus to do a third crew, eh, it's really, you know, um, it's only the difference between the 740 and the 801 for capital plus the personnel costs. So it's really only the 272, or is that 212 up there? You know, unfortunately, my eyesight's not that good. It's 212 plus the, uh, the difference between um, the capital outlay of uh, 800,000 and 740,801, 61,000, because that recurring dollars can be used to buy another set of the dump trucks and other equipment that they need to do for the crew. So we are very committed to try to do that and to try to improve the situation that we can in that area. And I think that's consistent with what we understand, what we think the board may tell us is, is, a, is a, an important priority uh, moving forward. And the last area that I, that I want to, uh, to, to touch on before we turn it over to another very important area, which is utilities, is additional impact of infrastructure on our county facilities and the dollars that we've dedicated. Over the last two years, we've been committed to dedicating additional dollars to uh, address deferred maintenance at county facilities. And so in the last two years, I've combined this, but it's increased. So it's like it was 700 and something thousand one year. We went to 850,000 uh, the following year. That got us to the 1.6 million. And what this slide shows you is what upgrades we've done in a variety of areas. I can tell you that uh, we have a Moore Justice Center. Oh, it's the Moore Justice Center saying that project. I thought it was the North Brevard. Was it not? Oh, that's another project, uh, that we're going to need that in a, in a future year. This year, we've actually made some adjustments, and it's coming to the board. Uh, on North Brevard, um, that's actually going now, and that cost is higher than we anticipated. And you'll see an agenda item, and, and so I, I got those two uh, confused. And we're currently replacing it at the North Brevard, uh, you know, the, the six-story courthouse as, as we speak. Um, and that's coming in a little higher than what we anticipated because of increased costs. And we've made, you, you're going to see a BCR coming that's going to, you know, at least fully fund that because that's important. But next year, the thought is that it's going to be around 1.7 million to do the more 
more justice center. Um, and we're committed to doing that. Um, and then beyond that, what we've indicated is uh, I've asked facilities. They are currently doing a, uh, and, and you'll see this in, in an audit finding that uh, recently was coming out and, and is going to come before the board in terms of um, an enhanced uh, assessment of what the needs are for facilities. And so they're in the process of, of working that through in a way that will enable us to figure out where our focus needs to be in terms of future needs. They know that in 2021, we have over a million dollars that they've over identified that in two years, those are critical needs that they know and want us to to be able to fund. We intend to do that because every year, once again, just like we're doing for roads, we're trying to add more dollars every year and make sure those dollars stay in the pot for additional needed improvements in the future rather than the money disappearing and, you know, in different budgets and then what happens, you have no dollars left to do uh, additional needed infrastructure projects. So we have that. Uh, those are ones that we believe need to be committed, but beyond that, I said, well, then we'll be up to date. No, we're not up to date. Uh, the next slide shows you that, you know, we still have another almost $26 million of unfunded capital improvements. Some are going to be need to be higher priorities, but we'll determine that over time. And this assessment that I just mentioned that facilities is in the middle of doing, that'll help us tell which ones need to be prioritized when. And so Scott Barrett and the rest of the facility staff is, is working to do that. So that gives you, I hope, a, a good overview in as simple a terms and as quick as I could reasonably you know, put it together to give you all the information in terms of what we are trying to discern from what we've heard from the board in the past and currently. And then we look for your input in terms of, hey, is this the right path to go? Uh, if it meets with the board approval, what we'll do is give you another really critically important item before we go to the charter officers, which is, you know, utilities and where they are. And, and, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Eddie Fontenin, who's our assistant director, uh, who we plan to um, uh, bring for confirmation, depending on how he does today, of course. Um, <laughs> No pressure. No pressure. Yeah, no pressure. Uh, I'm sure my uh, kids are watching too. Um, well, just to give you a brief overview, um, the utilities area for Brevard County that we service encompasses 62,000 customer service, 8,400 water customers, and those 8,400 are in the MIMS, um, the MIMS area, the Barefoot Bay, and the San Sebastian, and both of those are in South Brevard. Right now, when these numbers are growing as development grows, we consist of 296 lift stations and approximately 877 miles of a combination of force main gravity sewer and waters, and that's what we're responsible of maintaining. This is a slide just to give you a representation of our revenue for fiscal year 1819, and as you can see, um, you know, the miscellaneous, the license and permitting, the other financial sources, which is predominantly our state revolving fund that we're using to fund large projects, charges for service and our balance forward, as Jill described what the definition of the balance for forward. Our expenditures um, consist of our uh, transfers, which is our payment in lieu of taxes, our equipment, our debt service, our revenue operating, compensation for staff, and um, CIP. <coughs> this, is a, uh, this is a snapshot taken from April of 2018, but it kind of shows a comparison of how our rates are in comparison to other utilities regionally and whatnot. And as you can see, Brevard County Utility Services, which is right now, um, it's the fourth or the fifth from the bottom. That is, that is anyone in our service district outside of Barefoot Bay. As you can see further up, Barefoot Bay is, um, has a higher rate. And that is based on that the structure of Barefoot Bay is, is that only expenditures, revenue generated within that district can only be spent within that district which instead is, you know, anyone else outside of that district, the money can move around. So we have that flexibility. To give you a kind of a comparison of how um, a rate increase or <coughs> decrease or whatnot um, affects us is 
an average of 1% increase equals 350000 to our budget in order to do capital or maintenance, which on, a, on an average single-family home, a 1% increase would equate to approximately $0.45 cents per month addition. So to give you a brief overview, in, in 2013, the department took a strong initiative to take a look at the department and to find out in terms of the infrastructure and the status of the infrastructure of where it was held. And basically, uh, through that assessment, it was viewed that, that the life expectancy a lot associated with our lines, our lift station, our treatment plant were meeting their life and expect expectancy. And as a result of that, based on the current rates that we were getting, it wasn't sufficient, which is why in fiscal year 13-14, the commission approved for a rate increase to give the department the funds necessary to deal with those R&R projects. This kind of gives you a brief overview of how that plan originated in, 20, in uh, fiscal year 13-14 and where we are today. And as you can see, the numbers are moving. It's a very dynamic. Um, what I think this slide really shows is, is how us as a department are continually looking at needs of improvement and shifting dollars and allocation to address those needs. Um, as you can see here, we've upped our, we've already met our commitment and exceeded our commitment on sewer lining and projecting even more given the circumstances of recent along with increasing our commitment on what we want to do on replacement of water main and sewer. Yeah, can you go back to that prior yes. slide? Because I think that's a really important one. Um, you know, you can see the significant increase over what was in their original plan at 78 miles. And when you look at what we've completed, that 82 plus the 40, so that's, you know, over 120, that's over a 50% increase. So that's what is already committed to in that 10-year plan in terms of doing the relining in different areas. The other things that you can see in there in terms of um, the, the mileage, in terms of what they're doing, water main or sewer replacements, those, that mileage, you can see there was initially 22 miles um, was looked at um, and you can see how much we're planning to do in those areas and, and sometimes we're getting additional resources from other areas to uh, within their budget to accomplish that. That all relates to uh, issues related to you know both the lagoon and to the uh, the hurricanes that we've experienced. So they are making the modifications. There's going to be and you're going to see in when Eddie takes over for the rest of what he's going to talk about that they also have, a, I think, a rather aggressive plan for assessments in a variety of areas to address it. So um, this is not the all end all. This is just the beginning of, of what they are working on to do uh, in as uh, reasonably aggressive a fashion as they can. So <coughs> go on. Sure. Well, to give you a to talk about those initiatives that Frank mentioned. So the, the first thing that I want to talk about is, is you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the focuses were related to around I&I and, I and obviously how the, you know, the detriment when you don't address it. And prior to, you know, what, what, a, what we're looking at doing is, and this is going to be coming on the second agenda in March for the budget transfer, is there are um, is to do a sole source with a vendor that basically does an assessment of our gravity system and through that assessment they use a national rating system it's called NASCO and through the NASCO rating system it gives it a grade of zero through five the benefit for us as a department when we have that information is it tells us where we need to put the investment in and sometimes the investment is to do sewer lining. Sometimes that the grading of it is beyond what sewer lining can do and it requires a full repair. But it really gives us a plan, a program that we can set up. And the beauty of it is it gets graded on, a G, on, on GIS. So anyone, the public, yourself, can look to see what the program is by that grading. So we're going to be bringing that to you shortly. Um, we're also looking at, you know, <coughs> beyond taking the, the you know, um, 
for us to be not just dependent on vendors is to also utilize the software and this technology in-house. So we're also looking at on our TV trucks that go out there and do these assessments on our own. We want to get the same software that our vendor will use. So when we merge that data, it's on an apples to apples comparison and we want to get that along with training for that. We've completed the smoke testing for two sections of Satellite Beach and Indian Harbor Beach and really the focus of that was to identify um, leaking um, sewer laterals. That's really the benefit when you do smoke testing. Um, the benefit in terms of mainline isn't as much, but definitely when you do sewer laterals, I think we located, I think, approximately 60 or 80 laterals. And again, laterals is as severe as an issue when it comes to I&I &I because, it, again, it's a source of rainwater entering our system that obviously takes up that capacity. Currently with Sorrel, we have five regions in our current septic areas that we're in design phase of converting those from septic to sewer, from, yes, septic to sewer. So those are in progress. In addition, we're also looking at not only some activity this fiscal year, but moving forward of starting to generate hydraulic models. And those hydraulic models are a benefit to us as a department because we actually get to simulate conditions and assure ourselves that the sizing of infrastructure that we plan in the future is appropriate. Currently this fiscal year, we have programmed 1.6 million of sewer lining. Um, We've piggybacked that through a contract um, through, the, through Miami-Dade and 1.6 million gives you approximately about 10, 11 miles of sewer lining to put that. So when we talk about, when we talk about the budget, we're not looking only at the present, but we're also challenged to have a vision beyond. And what we, what our goals are is um, us as a department, given that the size of the department that we have, but in, when in comparison, when you look at how this utility services area is expanding through development and whatnot, we need to invest in having more staff in order to accomplish the corrective maintenance and preventative maintenance that we need to do. Um, examples of that and it ties in is valve exercise programs. There should be a cycle of about one to two years that every valve be operated to give us that um, dependence when we have situations in the field. And also developing a fats, oils, and grease program, which currently we're in draft mode of preparing. The benefit of that is when you deal with the fats, oils, grease, is to be a deterrent for the commercial, i.e. restaurants, of dumping their grease because when that occurs, it takes up our capacity, which again, it shrinks and causes surcharges that we're trying to avoid. Some current initiatives that we have going on in terms of um, our department is we are looking at the, we're in the design phase for the expansion of phase two of the North Courtney um, force main extension, the benefit of this. This will be the main transmission line. So when we start talking about septic to sewer, especially in that North Merritt Island area, this will be the artery that it feeds into that will ultimately go to the Sykes Creek plant. Um, West Cocoa Collection Area, this is basically the utility area in the I-95, 520 area. Um, currently, it's also identified as a major source of I&I, and, I, and we've, um, we're probably at the 95% of the design completion. We plan on using state revolving fund in order to, um, in order to fund this project. And um, last but not least, and it's also one of many, but the Riverside Drive Force Main, this is Riverside Drive. And this was identified as a, uh, one of the main force mains associated with what feeds South Beaches. Um, due to the material at the time, it was found that there was severe cracking that has occurred. So in addition to the, a replacement, we're also upsizing it to give us more capacity for that. Is yes, that concrete asbestos or, or what is that? It was, uh, it was PVC. But um, 15 years ago, what occurred was there was a, um, 
uh, the material of the PVC wasn't conducive to the pressures and the vibration, so thus we're, we're replacing it in order to improve on that. How big a line is that? Currently, right now, it's... 3.1 miles is what we're talking about in, here. In terms of the actual diameter, diameter of it, yeah. Um, I believe it's a, currently a 24, and we're upsizing it to a 30 inch. Oh, so it's huge for PVC, then? Yes. Okay, I appreciate it. Okay. Um, so, in addition to those projects, um, we're, you know, us as a department, we're constantly working with natural resource. We see this opportunity as a partnership in terms of utilizing those soil funds in terms of not only achieving the goal of what you know the Indian River Lagoon program is but also an opportunity for us to get those connections on and obviously there's a partnership so we're meeting weekly with them in terms of developing further and further opportunities to do that and we you know when we talk about sewer lining um, this isn't like a one and done I know I refer to it to this year but really sewer lining is, as you know, as the previous slide mentioned, and I know it's, it, it was, you know, a collective number, but we have 877 miles, and I know that included force main and gravity, but a large percentage of that is really gravity sewers. So we intend to make this a culture of a program that sewer lining constantly be assessed and, and rectified. So... That slide was, you know, there's so much good stuff. I want, we needed two sheets. So, um, again, when we talk about the sewer assessment, and I know, you know, like I mentioned, the second agenda in March, we'll be talking about um, the sewer assessment with the South Beaches and with regard to Barefoot Bay. Our rationale to that is, is that we want to get those assessed because in the last few storms that we had, those were the highest input um, outputs for I and I. So we wanted to get those addressed, but like we talked about the uh, we talked about the sewer lining. We really want to continue the assessment, which includes the remainder of our area, with Merritt Island probably being um, you know fiscal year 20, because again that was another point of that we want to obviously address, and due to the age of that infrastructure. Um, you know, again, and, and, and I hear this in a lot of conversations that a lot of the emphasis keeps talking about the sewer, the sewer, the sewer, when it becomes to I and I. But you have to remember when we talk about I and I, it's about point sources of rainwater entering our collection system. And as we discussed, we talked about the smoke testing that was done over on the beaches to address the laterals. We talked about the gravity sewer and the sewer lining and the assessment. But we also need to focus on the manholes because if that's a point source too, we want to rectify that. So we're also identifying a program and we're developing that program through an investment in equipment and software and training <coughs> for staff where, as I mentioned before, the NASCO coding is the national coding for um, developing a grading system of a sewer line. You can do that same grading system on manholes. So again, that'll give us an, 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 uh, the ability to grade and develop a program around that. Um, you know, again, we talk about the infrastructure, the lift station, and I know the in the spreadsheet where I showed all the numbers, we, you know, we were obviously moving numbers around and whatnot, but we haven't lost focus that without those pumps operating, the system doesn't operate. And currently, right now, internally, we're probably about three quarters of the way. We're reassessing our remaining lift stations to reprioritize because, again, it's a very fluid, um, you know, need, and we want to be current with that. Um, we are looking, and I know, um, you know, again, when we talk about the septic to sewer, the key question that comes in is what about the capacity? And we're currently looking at um, future growth areas, and I'm going to save that a little bit because I'd like to talk about that in about two more slides in terms of what we're doing on the um, review about the growth and how that's related to the capacity. Um, we are doing a... Um, assessment of the nitrogen and phosphorus as we talked about as I spoke earlier 
we are meeting regularly with natural resource and again when we talk about the partnership is we too as a department see the need of reducing nitrogen and phosphorus and the need of how septic to sewer can accomplish part of that goal so we're constantly working with them in addition to assisting them in ways that we can get data to build that case um, as I mentioned before, uh, when the rates were originally increased in fiscal year, what's that? Oh, sorry. All right, I'm have you do this. I, <laughs> I get all into this. Um, so when we talk about it, you know, in fiscal year 13, 14, we're currently in a six year of a 10 year program. You know, again, if you, if you associate it based on the slide before we have made changes to that program based on some of the needs some of them have been due to failure some of them have been due to issues that we want to f that we find more important and we're, we're changing that but we're making very good progress on that the sewer assessment uh, we're talking about having that complete uh, hopefully by the, our goal is to have that by fiscal year 2021 is to do the assessment and you know keep in mind as we do the assessment we plan on the sewer lining being concurrent behind so as you know low grades are identified in that process the contractor who does the sewer lining follow right behind to address it so instead of waiting for waiting for the report and then implementing it this is going to be a dynamic system the valve exercise program again and I use the word culture because this isn't you, do, you just don't do valve exercise on a one on a one cycle and you stop it's it's constantly it's constantly embedded and that's what we you know we refer to as preventative maintenance so in order for us to stay up on the preventative maintenance it's going to be a permanent culture within the department the manholes that we talked about with regard to the assessment and again we're looking at about a seven-year program but keep in mind, currently, and as I mentioned, the, the, the utility expansion is growing. Currently today, there are 11, uh, approximately 11,500 manholes that fall under the jurisdiction of our department. So that's our goal of what we're trying to accomplish. Yes, sir. Eddie, just a real quick question on the valves. Is it one particular variety of valve that you tend to see malfunction or, or fail more often than others? For instance, is it ball valves versus gate valves? or? It's typically gate valves is what's used out on a force main. I mean, obviously, I don't know the history of every valve that's been put in. I, I just didn't know if one stood out to you as being real problematic. Yeah, well, and, and just as, like a ball valve is typically used on a water main and not so much on a force main. Predominantly, a lot of our valves are really on the wastewater <coughs> side, even though we'll, we will be doing the water portion also. Right. All right, I appreciate it. Thank okay. you. Um, okay. So, the, you know, remaining lift stations requiring rehabilitation or replacement, we're looking to get that accomplished. You know, our goal is to get this accomplished by the 24 fiscal year, 24, 25 year. Again, we've had some shifting and whatnot, but um, we're also more confident now that this effort that we're doing in the reassessment of these lift stations will kind of give us more direction in the last four or five years on the completion. We talked about the collaboration of what we're doing with septic to sewer, and again, I can't emphasize that enough on uh, how we're constantly exploring new ways to utilize that. And, you know, I know I, I held this off, and I know I made reference to the last bullet, but really um, what this is is we're undergoing and we're in the, the draft of the task order, the development, is the a population projection analysis. And, and really what that is for us, this is probably the most significant planning exercise the county has done in over 20 years. And, you know, I'm new here, so... For me to make that declaration, I've, I've talked with other departments about that. And it's really a, it's an opportunity for us to look at a, a several layers of information. And, and again, we can, you know, to name a few, there's the TAS model, there's the Indian River Lagoon, and there's several layers that are indicators or sources of giving us an indication in terms of growth in the county and where that's occurring. And why, you know, from utility services benefit is, is that we recognize 
that, you know, treatment plant capacity needs to be reviewed, and not just to our three large plants, but to Barefoot Bay, Port St. John, and to MIMS, because if you think about it, those areas, even though they're undeveloped now, they can be, under, they can be developed in the future. And we want to be put in a position where <coughs> if the data comes back and we, you know, I have to come back to the commission and obviously explain the, the rationale of funding needed in order to support those projects, this becomes a tool or at least part of our due diligence in order to, to explain that. Well, that was uh, more than a mouthful, but I think I hope it gives the board a very good uh, idea in terms of, uh, you know, the focus and dedication that the utilities has in terms of, you know, putting us in the best position for the dialogue that the board, I know, uh, is, is having relative to, hey, are we doing all that we reasonably can do in this area, and do you have... We'll be I like the idea you. of the evaluation of the entire system yeah because then instead of addressing instead of being reactive or more being more proactive and and looking into the future future capacity needs that's important I, I'm really excited about that yeah I'm a big proponent of developing a program and this is going to be the basis of that program de being developed and through that it'll give us the information to know the true number of what we need to and you know for those future investments and I, I just want to Thank Eddie again. Uh, he's been very responsive to, I don't even want to estimate how many emails we've had go back and forth uh, on different issues, but I, I just want to say no thank problem. you. You've gone above and, and beyond. Oh, you're welcome. So, With that, you've, you've now seen two of the really big areas, uh, public works and utilities, and uh, we committed to the charter officers to give them time certain, and the first of those are going to be the clerk of court, Scott Ellis, coming up to uh, make... Uh, presentation on uh, his budget. I, I believe I saw him back there before. Pretty short. Do y'all need a hard copy? Whenever you're ready, Scott. Whenever you want. All right. Well, we've got uh, we've got the board side here, not the court side. We can get you the court side if you'd like to get it. Um, we've got the 10, 12-year track. What we've done on the board side, um, which has continued to come down mainly through technology. The other thing was for us when the board went to SAP. SAP moved a lot of functions out of the clerk's office down to the branches and the departments. So if you'd looked at our numbers back in 99, 2000, they'd have even been much larger. The biggest thing we have is a court system. We're at, I don't have a, a price right now. It's out at RFP. I don't know what it will come back at. This is just an estimate. Uh, it could be less. It could be significantly less. Our comparison would be if once we get a price, then we then we bounce the savings on what we get rid of versus what we get. So in other words, when the old system goes, we don't pay that licensing, don't pay the informix. Uh, we may or may not have to pay for jury, court tracking, other issues. 
We do have the money to go down payment. Do not have the money to spend on the rest of this. And I really, I can't gamble on signing a contract for that kind of money because another downturn would then crash us. Mr. Ellis, just a, a quick question. I, I don't know if you've spoken with, with my colleagues here or not about this, but if not, uh, could you just give them kind of a general overview or a synopsis uh, of why it is that you're switching systems and what the issues are in terms of ongoing upkeep with the system that you've got in place? The system's 20 years old. Um, we are the last Florida county on this system. It actually runs better even at 20 years old than a couple of the ones we've seen that are new, so they're out. Uh, but we have to have software that will work for Urban County. Our biggest concern is inability to get maintenance on it. Companies probably on the fourth or fifth company since I've been clerk, as they go through continuous buyouts. Uh, we have an informix database, which is, is fairly rare in the industry. We would go to SQL. It doesn't do the range and air checking that a good system should, and we can't really fix that. So the biggest concern is this goes out, out of date, basically. Um, my IT director is retiring in 2020. Uh, I would like to get this started before Ted and I both leave. I don't want to start something up at the tail end of my time and have someone inherit that. When I came into office in 2001, <coughs> did inherit a, a real software disaster. I never really thought about it, but I really used more of my experience as a programmer than anything else the first year as we dug out from that transition. So we, won't have, we will not do a transition like that, but if I can't start the program by this spring or summer, then we won't do anything. I'm not going to start something in the middle of 2020 and have it just barely up and someone else has to pick up the change. I, I have just one, <coughs> one quick question. So, if, and I know this is only an estimate, so you don't know yet, but if it's two and a half million spread over five years, does that include the 500,000 or is it then two million? No. Because the first money that has to go down on it, Frank, would be yeah. this year, okay. which is your current fiscal year. Well, right. I don't expect you to budget money right now right. for something like this. So it would be $2.5 million more over the next five-year right. period? Got, we've got approximately 700000 in the bank. I do have a concern. I think the housing is slowing down. It started slowing down early last year. Yeah. When the housing slows down, recording numbers will slow down. Our IT money is tied to recording numbers. Yeah. I think we're also going to see the slowdown on NOSA's commencement. As interest rates go up, we see a slowdown on refinancing of mortgages. And so uh, the reason I'm asking is I'm just trying to get a feel for your, your hope or expectation or, or, or request of the board. Would it be for like 400,000, potentially up to 400,000, but you would pay a portion of that if the funds are available? Is that would about be, what you're thinking about? It would be the funding for subsequent years to so this year. We would have a more precise number once we get the RFP. But, but your thought would be that the board would pick up the whatever that funding need would be, right? My hope is that. Okay, yeah, okay. My thought's not just necessarily that. Uh, my yeah. hope is that the difference would be picked up and we would be able to report to you a pretty decent number on the difference once we get through the RFP process. Right now, we just don't know. Mm -hmm. The problem with software, it's not like making a Ford truck. You make a Ford truck, you get a certain cost, labor, materials, you know what you've got. Software, your big money is involved with developing the software package, and then you just hand out copies of it. And so I'm not sure what they're going to try and charge us. We've told them all we don't have a lot of money. We've asked them to try and stay within the boundary of what we already pay for the current system, and if we can get an annual cost somewhere close to what we pay right now, and then we would make the down payment. I just don't know until we finish that process. We are in it right now. Um, we've got it, I think Leslie's handling that for us. And hopefully that's done probably within four to six weeks. At that point, I would have a real number. But I just wanted to let you know where we're at on this. 
if the board doesn't support it, and then we're just probably not going to do it unless we can get it get it way down there. Our money from the board is about two million dollars, and we just could not afford to take a half a million dollar hit, say in year three or year four. So if I don't have the board commitment, we're probably not going to get involved in it unless we can get it really cheap. And maybe we can. I just don't know till they come back in. Depends how much they want the business. Um, we are in urban county. I think they like to go to the urban counties. Clerks Association is handling all the uh, rural counties. The program works for them. It will not work for urban county. Uh, just a, a quick question to follow that up. As to the, the current status, is my understanding correct in that you've received all the proposals uh, at this point in time, but you're in the process of evaluating them? Well, we're still getting, we st the last I saw about a week ago, we still had some questions coming in. Okay. So as the question comes in, generally they're being answered by the IT staff, and they're looking for the information on our system. But in, in terms of the, the raw numbers, my, I guess my concern, I'll, I'll just, I'll start there. I, 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 just, I have no raw numbers. My, yeah, my concern is if we approve the whole amount, I don't want the folks that are putting out proposals to say, well, he's got this chunk available, so let's, let's come in at 100% of what's available. But, 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 I'm not, but I'm not here today looking for an approval of any amount. What I'm looking at more so is the concept. We don't go forward with anything until I have the approval of the board. I don't expect to have an approval of the board. I'm trying to think if we're in February, March. Probably would want to bring something in April and come in for board approval or board disapproval. At that point, if I have a board approval, then I expect it to be in your budget for next year. And if it's disapproved, it's disapproved. But that's when I would have the number to come back before the board. Today, all I have is the concept. It's just not ready yet. I appreciate it. Quick question. Uh, if it's two and a half over five years, and then you have 500 down payment, as, as uh, Mr. Abate said, 400, um, but you also mentioned a delta, uh, potential savings as far yes. as the maintenance. Yes. Uh, what, is your, what is your annual uh, maintenance uh, for the outdated if, system? If right they now? could replace everything, I think we'd estimate it five to 600,000. I don't know they can replace everything. So there may be an extra $100,000 savings that may be realized per annum if, oh, if yes. that. Oh, uh, yes. In theory, it, it could be that. It could be, it could be more. I don't know if they've got, it, like, the jury program. Okay. All right, the in-court processing program, the file tracking program. Um, SQL Server should definitely be cheaper than the Informix. I would hope the maintenance would, would not be any more expensive. Yeah, this is this is all well above my head. My, I'm just trying to get the per per annum cost, and if we start at five hundred thousand, and then you chip in, the fi uh, sorry, five hundred thousand per year over five years, you were you have that down payment, which would defray the, the first, cost. The first five hundred. Yeah, yeah, but either way, I'm just trying to figure this out per annum. Right. And then there, you would realize a hundred thousand potential, hundred thousand dollar savings per annum. Right. Well, you have stuff. to remember, you know, Commissioner, I, I'm not going to come back before the board. Till I have real numbers. I, I get it. I'm just trying to figure out. So, so this right. 500,000 could be substantially less, is what you're. It, it could be less. Thank you. Um, I don't expect it to be a lot more because we're just not going to pay it. There's only so much we can afford to get on the hook for on this, and I don't see the recording fees continuing to rise. We've seen them already starting to fall somewhat. I don't think it will be as disastrous as it was back in eight, nine, and ten, but. When things start to drop, luckily people have real mortgages this time, so we're not going to see the, the basically the waves of foreclosures we saw the last time. But we will see a slowdown in what sells, and we'll see a slowdown in refinancing because if mortgage rates rise, there's nothing to refinance for. And, and I don't think they're given that we've seen some refis, but not the crazy refis, the second, third, fourth mortgage type thing we saw back in four, five, and six. And one, one final, um, since your budget comes out of general revenue and we have a, we've been told a CPI of 2.44, just in raw numbers, 
that would be roughly a fifty thousand dollar it looks like fifty thousand five hundred dollar increase outside of this software looking at the numbers that you've provided us it looks like your budget has actually decreased am I am I reading that correctly pretty flat thank you pretty much flat it's just we have a certain number of positions and it, it's not it's not an area that grows it's shrunk due to technology but I don't expect it to shrink so it, it's primarily just calculating the cost of the people that are there um, the one thing that we have had bumped up the last few years has been our facilities allowance uh, so for example changing out carpeting for tile or, or the plastic wood um, it just works a lot better facilities money comes to us and then comes back to you for the most part, but it's easier for county facilities to work for us with a work order from the clerk's office than to be caught in a facilities queue behind everything else. But for budgeting purposes, Jill, that facilities money is not general revenue. Is that? It, it is general fund revenue. But it's not, just not, not in his part, budget. Okay. It's not in his budget. It's part of the uh, what we call Article Five. Uh, it goes into the. Right. The mandates the court facilities. Okay, because right. part his of it is just like, like yeah. the phone system. There's certain things that under Article Five the board is supposed to pay for, and then what's above that is what we use when we get work done in the buildings, which we don't own it, obviously, but the work needs to be done. So, hopefully, my last question for you: Have you looked at, or maybe it's already in the. Um, the, the RFP, have you looked at having the companies turn over the source code at whatever point in time they cease to support it any longer so you don't have a problem? Well, I guess it wouldn't be I, I've already had to do that. Uh, I was very sad with the Incorp program. It was with CSI. Uh, unfortunately, the programmer passed away. That's so problem. so we now have the source code for that. I could tell you that's not where you want to be. A as someone that programmed for 20 years, that then you have to have an army of programmers to maintain it, and you are on your own. You don't want to butcher the, butcher the code if you have a live system. Now, if you have a dead system, that's how you get stuck with the source code. And I can tell you that's really not where you would like to be. Uh, most uh, people are getting away from a homegrown system because what happens is, let's say I buy a software package from your company and it's still alive. You're going to come out with updates, and you're going to come out with upgrades. And they're designed to work on that system. If I've had three or four programmers go in there and start messing with the code, your upgrades, your updates are not going to fly. And let me let me clarify because I, I don't think I was I was abundantly clear with it. I, I'm not talking about the system that you currently have in place. I'm talking about the system that you're looking to, to implement, whatever that ends up being, <coughs> so that 15, 20 years from now, whatever the number of years is, certainly certainly beyond 10 years out, whoever's sitting in your position. Um, will have the advantage of having that source code potentially turned over to them at that point in time so that they don't have to negotiate years later uh, when whatever company you purchase it from ends up ceasing to I mean, honestly, if you're, not, if you're not Grumman or Harris, <coughs> it doesn't pay to have the source code and work on it yourself. Uh, we've only got a handful of people that, that do software. A lot of it is report writing. We'd have to actually put programmers on board to learn it. Most, most places are getting away from homegrown software. Makes because, sense. It, because quite truthfully, homegrown software has the same problem. If I've got homegrown software, let's say that Frank and Jill are my gurus, and then you retire. And now where are we at? So, so you really don't want to get in a position where you have the source code. You prefer to have it with the vendor. They make the modifications. They do the upgrades, and they do the updates. <coughs> with the one program, which is just the in-court processing, so in other words, you're in court, judge says, you know, $500, whatever, you click, 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 away it goes. We had to take that over. The company could not maintain it because their programmer passed away. So, so we just, either we took it over or they were going to let it go. So we took it over. But on a major court system, you really don't want the source code. And it's no different, just like you have a lot of software here in the county, you really don't want the source code. Because if... Unless you've got a lot of good configuration management, anybody can get in there and make changes and then they leave and you don't find out until a year later that something doesn't work anymore. Uh, you know, when you do a maintenance program, maintenance on a major program, you have a lot of configuration management you have to have to make sure whatever changes are made are, 
are documented so that it's when somebody comes back in five years ago, they know how that program was worked on. I mean, I worked at RCA years ago. I worked a lot of code that had been done by guys a long time ago. And it was an interesting exposure to why that having the source code is not always a big benefit. I appreciate so, it. So I'd be real wary of doing that. I certainly wouldn't want to do it. I, I would tell you that if we did not buy a new system, and, and I don't know what's Tiburon's, I don't know what their name is now. They've been four or five different things since I've been here. Um, we would probably be forced to go out and pay them for the source code and try and wing it. Makes sense. That we just wouldn't have a choice because we're the last one left. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's just where we're at. We'll be back when we get real numbers, you know, and get the feeling of the board. I just, I wish I had a real number to give you. I really don't until this RFP process plays through. Um, we've got two or three vendors that are, that are really looking to get the business. I don't know what's going to happen on that. Because, again, I go back into that with selling software. There's a certain price I could sell you a truck for. I really can't go below that. I truly lose money. But software, the way you duplicate software, you don't exactly have to go out and build a plant and run an assembly line and buy materials for it. So it's almost like, I don't want to say bootleg copies, but, but you think about it. I, I know if you're like your IT guys here, you, play, you pay a lot of maintenance and licensing on software just because. Because if you don't, they come and get you. Microsoft is another one. Um, there's, you just don't have any control over that. Okay. Anything appreciate else? It. No, appreciate you coming. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. I believe the next presentation we have up is the, the sheriff's office. And then after the sheriff's office, we'll take five minutes or ten minutes, I think. After this. Commissioner Dubai, I brought Judy for you to uh, be able to give a hug and a kiss to before I leave. Oh, my God. <laughs> I thought we had a dog policy in this. Uh... <laughs> He's a service dog. <laughs> That's a real lap dog. <laughs> yeah. That's a lap dog. So. Um, if, uh, this is uh, one of our sheriff's office dogs. He's uh, in our Paws and Stripes program. I didn't know if he was your dog. Oh, no, no. Well, this is the one that's always in uh, the videos and crime prevention stuff with us. So. This is actually um, uh, Junie. He's named after Junie Rios Martinez, a young man that in 1991 was abducted and murdered here in Brevard County. So. He is, uh, he is just like uh, Commissioner Smith said, a big lap dog. So. He's amazing. Um, I, um, I asked Scott to, to stay. I'm not sure if he um, uh, had something to get back to. But before Greg jumps into our presentation, um, having not heard uh, Mr. Ellis's presentation, um, I was sitting there thinking and talking with members of our team. Um, we have a system, New World, that um, we believe uh, case management um, would be supported by. Um, so, uh, you know, as, as an opportunity, it would certainly take out all the soft dollar costs um, everything like that. So we'll we'll get with Scott and his team, see if that's something that would work. If it is, um, I would think there'd be significant costs um, on it. Plus, the New World system that we have is married to most of the police departments within the county as well. Um, so it would be um, great data and information sharing um, from there. So um, with that, um, thank you guys for having us um, this afternoon. And uh, our CFO Greg Pelham is going to take the presentation from there. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, this first uh, slide here is just a pie chart that shows you the breakdown of our fiscal year 2019 revenue budget. Um, our total budget is just over $130 million. You can see that $96 million of that comes from the general fund transfer from the board. Um, the majority of the rest comes from the taxes generated from the law enforcement MSTU. Um, the next slide, uh, next two slides are basically just breaking down the revenues that we receive by the individual programs that we have. We have the, uh, our law enforcement uh, operations at $44 million, the county jail, judicial operation, uh, operations, the court deputies, animal services. You'll see that uh, we also have contracted services. These are negotiated contracts with the Canaveral Port Authority and the City of Cape Canaveral to provide law enforcement services for them. 
and then as I mentioned, our law enforcement MSTU, which is the unincorporated area that uh, provides road patrol and general crime investigation to the unincorporated areas. Uh, the next one is a, is a pie chart that just breaks down our expenses. You can see that the compensation and benefits is just over 103 million. That is approximately 80% of our budget. So we're talking about the road patrol deputies, the investigators, and all of our support personnel, dispatchers, and that type. Um, and again, this is following the same thing with the revenues. It's just breaking it out by the individual programs. Um, you can see that the contracted services are 9.3 million. We negotiate those annually with the city and the Port Authority. This next one is one that shows how we compare on a per capita basis to our surrounding areas. And as you can see from a law enforcement standpoint, at $141 per capita, we're doing our job much better and for a more efficient and effective price than the surrounding uh, areas. Our jail operations, this is another graph that shows the same thing. One of the very interesting things on this, $71 per capita. Um, most of you may remember this, but Seminole County houses federal prisoners and gets reimbursements from the federal government and we're still much lower than them, even taking that into consideration. Um, the items that we wanted to identify for you guys this year um, are the three things that we're uh, dealing with on a regular basis, which is our staffing, our starting salary for our law enforcement deputies, and some equipment and facility needs. To kind of give you some input on what we're dealing with, um, reached out to the Planning and Zoning Department and the Vieira Company. They're estimating that over the next five years there's going to be another 3,000 housing units completed in this area, adding approximately another 7,500 uh, residents. When I get to the next graph, you'll see how that plays into it. The other issue is, is the retention of our employees. Between 2016 and 2018, we had 122 sworn officers who left our agency seeking employment with our surrounding agencies for what we call increased salary considerations. They're paying more than us. Another one that plays into that is that every time we lose one of those people, we have to invest just short of $10,000 in identifying, completing a background check, and training that person's replacement. At 122 that we've lost over the last two years, that's about $1.17 million that we've invested in those people to replace them. And this is the one that, that kind of brings it all together. The county's comprehensive plan calls for two deputies per 1,000 residents, which at our current population would be 462 deputies on the road right now. We have 402. With the projected growth between now and fiscal year 2020, we would need 482. So we're running 60 to 80 deputies short of meeting what the comp plan is calling for. Part of that reason is illustrated on this particular graph. This was updated just last month, so this is as of January 2019, and this is the starting salary for a police officer or a deputy for the municipal uh, agencies within our county. You can see that we are fifth on this list, being the preeminent law enforcement agency in the county. The other issue is, is our surrounding counties and Orlando PD. You can see that we are sixth out of those eight right there. Um, and it's projected to get a little bit worse. We did find out that some of the agencies already have planned increases for the next year and two years that will increase their starting salary even more. One of the other issues that we've been dealing with is our vehicle replacement. We currently have 584 vehicles between patrol vehicles, investigative vehicles, uh, prisoner transportation vehicles, and animal services. We have a plan to try and replace our vehicles on a six-year, 125,000 mile, and we do evaluate it on each one to replace the vehicles. Based on those numbers, we should be doing between 80 and 90 vehicles a year. Um, over the last six years, 
we've only done 294, leaving a deficit of where we should be at approximately 186 vehicles. As you all know, the more you drive the vehicles and the higher mileage, that costs more to maintain them and service them each and every year. So we're seeing an increase in our maintenance costs related to our vehicles over each year. Some of the other things that we have is our tasers. Um, we have 586 tasers in the agency. 75% of those are nine years or older. Um, all of those are out of warranty. We've also been noticed that after this year, they will no longer make the cartridges and batteries for those specific tasers. So we are looking into a plan to try and replace those tasers. Uh, to give you an idea, to buy every one of those tasers outright is just over 1.1 million, and it comes with a recurring annual cost of $412,000 a year. So we're looking at just short of 1.5 million in the first year. Our AEDs. Um, every one of our deputies has an AED in their car. Um, they have turned out to be a tremendous asset. Uh, we currently have 588 deployed in our buildings and in our vehicles. 90% um, of those were acquired prior to fiscal year 2012. 529 of those are out of warranty and they, they come with a seven-year warranty. To replace all of those, is $663,000 with an annual recurring cost of $32,000 a year. Yes, sir. Quick question on the, on the tasers. Uh, <coughs> looking at the 586 that are in use now, I'm trying to figure out if there are 402 deputies, do some of them have backups or what, where does the extra, the delta and that go between the 402 and the 586? Some of them are assigned to our investigators and some oh, of them are assigned okay. to our court deputies. As well as, um, as corrections well, also. As well at the jail. As okay. As well. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, at the bottom of the slide, Narcan. Um, you've probably seen the news related to that in dealing with some of the uh, overdoses that we've been uh, experiencing here and nationwide. Um, the cost for a two-dose packet is $75 per packet. To put one of those in each one of our deputies would be $42,000 a year. Um, we have to balance that with the shelf life on it. Um, it has to be maintained in a certain environment. If it's maintained in that environment the whole time, the shelf life is 18 months. If it's not, it would deteriorate sooner, so it could be as little as 12 months. So the operational recurring cost could vary from year to year depending on those types of things. Um, Another one of our issues is uh, some of the facilities that we currently occupy. As you're aware, our West Precinct is sharing Building E with the Public Defender's Office. Both the Public Defender and us are bursting at the seams and we're needing a little bit more space for that. Um, our countywide communications and dispatch is housed at the Parkway Complex up in Titusville. It's a former junior high middle school that was opened in 1960. Um, we're running out of space there. In addition to that, our evidence unit is also housed in the Parkway Complex in about 5,000 square feet. They maintain all of the evidence for current ongoing cases. Um, we're running out of space there. We, so we really could use some more space there in, in those particular issues. Um, on the next one, it, it's, this is just some of the things that we've done partnering with the board and with the uh, the county manager to try and address some of these things. <coughs> Since 2007, we've been providing between $542,000 and $747,000 annually to the board to make debt payments for the criminal investigative building in Rockledge, the North Precinct building in Titusville, our CAD records management uh, system, and the hangar for our aviation unit out at the um, Merritt Island Airport. So since 2007, we've provided about $7.7 .7 million to fund some of our facility needs. Another one of the things that we're doing this year, the 800 megahertz tower at the Parkway Complex, um, it's being upgraded to allow for microwave connectivity. Um, that is costing approximately $100,000 that we're paying for. It was either do that or have dedicated circuits put in and the requirement for 911 with the dedicated circuits meant they had to be up 
9% of the time. The estimated cost on that annually was $60,000 a year, so we thought this was a much better way to move forward with it. In all of these things that we've partnered with you and done, no ad valorem taxes have been used. So it, nothing has come from uh, property tax monies. And, you know, it's, we're one of the few agencies that has come to you partnering to, to get these things done. So, Sheriff? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just I'll so tag on it too. We, what we try and do, and um, uh, just uh, take a moment to say, um, Frank and, and his team work with us very, very well as partners on um, everything we do. We, we try and, you know, we understand that um, there's, there's limited revenue. Um, we try and find solutions uh, to, uh, to the problems that present themselves. And uh, um, we've been able to do that. As you see, the, the CAD system alone, um, uh, if we would just came to the board and said we need a new CAD system, it would have been about $4.2 million. Um, but we were able to find a solution for that by um, uh, taking the licensing from our old system and the maintenance fees and everything else and being able to um, get it into this program where we're, we're making annual payments on it. Um, Greg and his team do a great job for us working with Jill and, and uh, that team. But, um, you know, our, our main focus right now, as Greg said, is our, our vehicles, um, our salaries for our, our employees. Um, every time we lose uh, a, a veteran employee of our agency, as Greg said, it's almost a $10,000 hit just to recruit, um, uh, train, and, and do the backgrounds and everything else on those individuals. So in two years, we've, we've lost basically $1.1 million um, of employees that, um, that were not only good employees but left because they were going to an agency that paid more. So we, um, we have those. Um, we have the growing pains that most everyone is experiencing. I know Frank and his team are looking at the growth of Vieira and, and uh, as, as great as it is for our community to have that kind of growth, it certainly presents challenges, especially with our um, West Precinct and, and our needing to grow that precinct to accommodate not only the comprehensive plan, but just what we know it takes to, uh, to protect our citizens. We've been very fortunate. Uh, we've created a great partnership with our citizens, and um, I, I tell other sheriffs and chiefs when they talk about the success we've had in lowering our crime rate over the last six years by 30%, um, it is because we have a great partnership with our community. Our citizens help us solve crimes every day, but more importantly, they help us prevent crimes. And uh, that's, that's how you truly lower your, um, your crime rate. Um, we, uh, you know, we, we try and be as good partners as we possibly can. And, uh, you know, animal control, uh, taking over animal services for the county, um, while uh, a, a lot of our team thought it could be a, a very difficult situation for us, um, we're extremely proud of the success our team has had in taking um, uh, and making us a um, no-kill um, facility, which is just almost unheard of for government-maintained facilities. And uh, we're just we're going to continue um, working to try and make sure we provide the absolute best um, protection and service we can. And I know each of you agree with me that um, government's primary responsibility is to protect its citizens, and that's what uh, that's what we took an oath to do, and we're going to continue to do. I, I'll just add uh, just two cents to that, which is uh, we do appreciate the opportunity to be working you know, with the sheriff and the staff. They're they're open to the dialogues of what I'll, I'll describe as some what are some out of the box opportunities that we can look at to make sure that we on the county staff side can maximize what we receive in the dollars that we know are limited in what we receive from the general fund and how do we minimize or get back some of those dollars uh, toward the end of the year uh, for so we can allocate it to the priorities that the board gives that are other critical needs uh, beyond what the sheriff is uh, allocating his resources for and he's working very well with us to try to identify s some opportunities that would give us uh, some extra dollars to help us in those areas. So well, we do appreciate those efforts. Yes, sir. Uh, good team. Madam Chair. Uh, I, I appreciate um, all the work you've done and I think it says a lot about a leader that the bulk of your um, request is funds for the, the folks that work so hard for Brevard County, um, your deputies. Um, I do have a couple questions since yes, a, a large of that, a, a great deal of that's dealing with, uh, I guess, uh, raises. Um, 
you said between 2016 and 2018, um, 122 uh, sworn officers left. And you said, uh, or here it says a majority were increased salary consideration. Um, do you do an exit survey to find that out? And and uh, what, what or I mean, what, what were other factors other than I guess salary considerations? There was just over 400 people that left the agency in that time period, and we did an exit interview with uh, every one of them. Um, the other reasons were people relocating to another part of the uh, to the area. Um, another one was the they wanted to pursue a different career path. Um, was another one that was a big one. Um, but these ones were the identified ones, the, the retirement and the ones that specifically told us they were leaving to go to another agency. Um, and, and to be honest, Commissioner, um, uh, a, a lot of them were leaving to go um, to Orange County, um, to uh, Orlando, both of which are paying, as you can see from um, the PowerPoint, roughly $10,000 more than what we pay. And we, we don't anticipate or expect to compete with that. Um, that's, that's unrealistic. Um, we, we have to focus on uh, what, is, what is within our community's ability. And, uh, um, but we, we do know we lose those individuals. And so not only, again, not only are we losing somebody that we've put a great deal of training into, because when you look at the, the dollar cost of, of uh, $9,642, I think it was, that, that doesn't account for all the training time and everything else. That's just to get them in the car and to start them on patrol of, of recruiting background, um, all the testing they go through and everything else. So um, that's, a, that's a significant chunk, that $1.17 million um, that, that we're trying to. And it, that, that $1.17, when we sit here again next year, that number will have grown um, uh, because that's, that's an ongoing problem that, that we're facing. We're trying to really um, uh, cut the cord on, on dealing with. Um, looking at the law enforcement, Brevard County law enforcement agencies, um, I see you're above the average, but still it looks like, according to your numbers, fifth. Yes, it looks like the delta is a little more than $2,000. My question is, four of the five municipalities do not offer Florida retirement system. Mm -hmm. um, as you're well aware, the Florida retirement system is extremely valuable. Yes. Um, and I looked at some of the retirement that um, Indian Harbor Beach and West Melbourne, too, that are higher, are nowhere near as advantageous to the employees as the FRS. Correct. A strong argument can be made that the package provided to the Brevard County Sheriff's Office is much better than that of ones that may receive 300 or $400 more. Is that not the perception that the employees, they do I, not take the Florida retirement system into account when, when determining yeah, I, whether or not to stay with the agency? If, if you take that same consensus and go back 20 years, um, you, you would have a, a very valid argument. Um, what I would tell you today is that um, with the changes that were made in, in FRS with the, um, uh, um, the plan where instead of having the full FRS um, retirement, you can now do it in the investment plan, um, uh, made that argument null and void because now they take their investments and they, they go uh, elsewhere. The other part of that is, um, and this is not a, a, a knock on any generation, but today's generation is not focused on retirement. Um, they're, they're focused on uh, what is right now, what is immediately in front of me, um, and so what used to be, in fact, if you go back 39 years ago when I started, what used to be a great argument of you're not going to make a lot of money now, but it's going to pay off 25 years from now in the FRS is no longer a valid argument. And, and to that argument, um, uh, the other agencies, if you look at the, the next um, slide um, and you see that Orange County, for example, pays $10,000 more. They're still the same FRS retirement system, and they allow their um, officers to live in our county. Um, and drive their patrol cars back and forth. Um, I'm I'm fighting an uphill battle, um, trying to trying to to uh, combat that. I, 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 I appreciate the, yeah, and the, the, the validity of the that. argument. Unfortunately, is may be not that the officers understand, but the contributions that taxpayers make mm -hmm. in order so your officers receive whether they appreciate it or not. Oh, they is they appreciate the it, but it's millions of dollars. Yeah, it's it's still you know that that argument. They they're going to Orange County or they're going to Polk. 
um, to those counties that are that are paying more money uh, one, from it. One final question. Um, I'm concerned that this potentially is getting into, a, uh, for lack of a better term, an arms race. Um, you mentioned, I think, that a couple of the uh, agencies ahead of us locally um, had planned budget increases. Correct. Um, how do how do taxpayers how, how do they feel the burden when we're trying to match um, the top? How do how do we you know how do we eventually does does this does where does this stop uh, where does this stop? I guess is the, is the question. If if this is continually going higher and higher and higher, is our goal you know to be one in Brevard County? And if so, where do you see that number landing in the next few years? I I would say this. Um, I, I the taxpayers that I talk to, and as you know, I'm in the community every day talking with everybody. Um, they love the fact that this is one of the safest communities in the state of Florida. They understand that our primary responsibility as government is to protect them. They love the fact that our crime rate's down 30 percent. They love the fact that when businesses are thinking about coming to Brevard County, they're thinking about coming because it's a safe community. They love the fact that. Um, our schools are safe. You know, we have the responsibility of school security. They love all of those things. Um, uh, obviously, we, as you can tell from our presentation, as you can tell from um, where we fit on the bar graphs of being the lowest per capita on both the jail and on the operations side, we, uh, we are a good shepherd of the taxpayers' dollars. But um, at the end of the day, one of the ways that we're able to maintain the professionalism, maintain the, the level of protection that we provide, is to make sure we're taking care of, of those that are out there putting their lives on the line each and every day. Thank you. Commissioner Pritchett? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for all you do, Sheriff. Oh, yes, ma'am. Just, uh, just a couple of thoughts. And, and I agree. When I, I talk to people, their, their priorities are always safety and infrastructure. And it's, it's nice to, to have all the things that make our ni lives wonderful, but these are two primary things that, that we have to have. And, and just on that note, I really want to thank you on what you do. I, I think you, you've run a very tight budget through the years. Actually, Mr. Ellis and the other constitutionals, I think, have done a great job also. Absolutely. So you guys are usually the least of my heartburn when I start thinking of, of things. And I've never heard anybody in the community say, you know, cut the, the first responders budget. I know we have the, the duty to watch over it. But, you know, just from being on the city of Titusville for so long and, and going through all the problems we went through with that, with the economic downturn, we, we had a real severe problem of trying to maintain officers. They're not on FRS, but they have a, another one with Titusville, which is the Cadillac of retirement. Really? I mean, it, it cost our budget a fortune over there trying to do that. Matter of fact, it almost bankrupted us until we did some adjustments. So I, I, I know FRS is good, but what we're paying in that, and my thought on that is, is they're just a little under you and, and they've got that retirement and they're having a hard time maintaining officers. Right. And, and so I, I see your numbers actually look a little bit low per capita and theirs are also. And that, that greatly concerns me with the day that we're living in. And I, I think we probably should cut your budget when crime goes away. <laughs> so I mean, that would be a wonderful place to get to. But um, I, I just think you're doing a really good job. And every time I get a chance to look through your things and, and look over what you're doing, I mean, even the money you saved us on animal services, I mean, you, you've stepped up. So I just, I just want to really commend you on that. And I, I really thank you that you're trying real hard to tweak this right now, too. But I completely understand that you need more officers. And, and I think they're worth it. And as far as the proportion of even what we do with fire, you're probably under. So it, it has my attention, sir, and I thank you. And I thank you for working hard trying to keep it down. Well, thank you, ma'am. As I tell everybody, I'm surrounded by an amazing team, and I'm smart enough to stay out of their way. They do great stuff. <laughs> they're they're uh, amazing individuals, and I, I just, I'm lucky enough to get to wear the same uniform as Well, I, I hope they like you, too, and that's not why they're leaving. <laughs> but I'm not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> John Lau's a great guy too, and they're leaving him. So, so I'm, I'm <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, Sheriff, just real quickly, I, I understand where um, my colleague Mr. Tobias is coming from with respect to the concern there may be some leapfrogging and people doing that. But I, I do want to point out, um, I think there's a tremendous psychological difference for someone looking at, at uh, working at a particular agency with the first digit beginning with a three versus a four. So to go even another 280 bucks, 270 some odd dollars. Um, I, I think there's a huge difference in, in the perception there. So I think, you know, you're, you're looking at a category where the numeric ranking may not be 
is critically important is, is that first digit when you're trying to attract people. So whether it's 41 and change or 40 and change or 42 and change, I, I think there is value in stepping up uh, to make that first digit appear uh, something higher than a three. I, I can tell you it's something where you may get folks uh, that simply, just as if you're shopping for a house, will limit the maximum, and if it's 100 bucks over, it's just not going to come through in the search. You may have the same with this, where if it's 100 bucks under 40, they may not apply for the job. So I, I think there, there's certainly a valid argument to raise that, at least to a degree. Uh, and as, as far as the, the deputies, I, I think you know you made a compelling case, and we've certainly spoken previously about the need for having more deputies. I think there is a need. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm certainly supportive within any degree of reason to, to giving additional funding to, to get a reasonable number of additional deputies. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You've been, been very supportive of You said from the very beginning public safety was going to be very high on, on your priority list. And I greatly Trying to keep it. with it. Yes, sir. I just want to thank you, too. I think, you know, until you've lived through and worked um, in a municipality and through contracts and understanding what a retirement benefit is that ultimately can bankrupt a city and, 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 the, and the politics that goes on with that. I mean, FRS is nothing compared to what some of these Cadillac city plans are, and that's a fact. And there's people in this room that have known and been through it with me once or twice. And it's ugly, I'll tell you what. But, but I don't even think people weigh that, quite honestly, when they're, they don't weigh FRS versus, or if they do, they say, well, hey, I mean, the city of Palm Bay at one time had 100% pension when you retired. So not only did you retire with that entire pension and they had a good salary to start, you also got more than 100% of your pay because we had a stipend, we had, they could drop, which I guess they picked that up from FRS. So I... You know, I don't ever, as far as leapfrogging and stuff, that happens. I take less stock in, in that concern. I mean, you're going to lose people, unfortunately, and we see it in every municipality and every department. I'm more concerned with your fleet. I'm more concerned with the jail, and which you have little, very little control over, no matter how much we kick and scream and, and yell at the people who do have power and control over the jail. But I think you do a great job for... for the resources you have over there, my gosh, I mean, I can't even imagine trying to manage all those people, but yeah, I, I mean, I don't have a problem with your budget, you know, you and I have hammered out some of those details, but I think, you know, it's always going to be a losing battle, and, in, and unless you're a gas station who, who all agrees to set the same price, it's, it's going to be a battle you're going to have forever. Yeah, great, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Anybody have anything else or questions? You can leave the dog. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think that's going to be hard to do. So. <laughs> well, thank you, you guys. And again, um, Frank, you and your team have been awesome to work you with. You guys thank need you, five friend. minutes? Yeah. It's like a couple hours before we're in. Do you want to take Come five? Come on, Big Junie. Probably Is that okay? Yeah. 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 Five, yeah. Minutes. five, seven minutes? Yeah. Great take a quick break. Please. All right, Thank five, seven, eight minutes. Yes,